Let's get those hands together. Let's not stop. Let's continue to worship him. God, you are beautiful. You're awesome. We worship you, oh God.
from that cross this morning. We don't want to take anything away from that glorious moment where you died and resurrected for our sins, oh God. Amen. Because you conquered everything, Lord God. Absolutely everything. And our eternal pain will never come close to your pain, oh God. So help us to endure life, help us to endure sickness, help us to endure stress, 
depression, negativity in our lives, Lord God. For the sake of the cross, for the sake of who you are, oh God. And now we hold on to the earth to that cross, oh God, because that's the only thing that we could hold on to, oh God. In Jesus' name. church family. <laughs> it's great to see everyone here today. Please let's take 30 seconds to greet new and familiar faces. Together, today we gather to celebrate the pinnacle of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we come together to open our hearts, let the joy and wonder of this miraculous event welcome all to Bronxville Community Church. Welcome, everybody. Okay, let me take you through our quick schedule today. Uh, first, um, I'm going to read a passage from the Corinthians. Then we'll have an opening prayer. We'll sing our doxology. And then we'll have a <clears throat> beautiful, meaningful passage of the Passover. In addition, after that, please all go to our welcome table. Everyone is welcome to our hospitality table in the back where we're going to have refreshments such as cake and coffee and chocolate. So please indulge yourselves and we'll be happy to see you all there. Janet and Priscilla will also be there to welcome you with a genuine smile and open hearts. So today's our first passage of the Corinthians. It's um, the first Corinthians chapter 15, verses six through seven. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. These verses are part of a larger passage in which the Apostle Paul is addressing the resurrection of Jesus Christ and its significance for us believers. In these specific verses, Paul is providing evidence for the resurrection by mentioning various appearance, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Overall, these verses emphasize the importance of eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection and establishing the foundation of our Christian faith and affirming our hope in the resurrection to eternal life. Let's focus our minds today in celebrating Jesus and his resurrection. So let us now bow our heads in prayer. And thanking, Lord, thanking the Lord for the gift of salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May his presence fill this place as we lift our voices in praise and worship. May this resurrection day service be a time of spiritual renewal and deepening of our, our commitment to follow Jesus with our hearts. Amen. I'm going to turn this over now to our worship team, and please rise for the doxology. Thank you. Praise God for Heavenly host, praise Father, 
Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would fall, that your Holy Spirit would come. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make your word come alive. God, I pray that these truths would burn in our hearts, and God, that we would desire a biblical definition of Easter, that that would be in our hearts. As believers, we would seek a biblical definition of of Easter. We love you, God. We say you are welcome here. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, listen, I um, want to start with Psalm 23. I don't really know why I am, but I am. And uh, I had somebody pray over me last night on Good Friday and just said, you know, I really see Psalm 23 for you, so I said, let me share this with our congregation. So I don't know who this is for, but I think it is for somebody. Listen to these amazing words. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Certainly goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life. And my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, God, for these comforting words. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, good morning, Bronxville Community Church. Happy Resurrection Day, everybody. He has risen. He has risen indeed. And because he has risen, we have freedom and life eternal with him. Turn to your neighbor to the left and to the right and say, he has risen, and now because he has risen, you have eternal life with him. Go ahead. Well, we have a lot of scriptures to share today. It is really exciting. I don't know if you all, some of you all are using the QR code. That's something we're going to try to do a lot more in our church because we use so much content. And so in the QR code, um, let me show of hands. How many of y'all are using the QR code currently? Raise your hand. Okay, very good. All right, some. So when you enter, there is a QR code that you can scan. And on that QR code, I have put all the scriptures for today. So you don't have to a page through the Bible. You can find all the scriptures if you like, but if not, you can page through and smell your wonderful Bibles today. It's better than cologne, right? All right, here we go. Today we're going to talk about a terrified group of disciples locked up in a room out of fear and how they gained the confidence and boldness to start an international global movement for Jesus and how you can have that kind of boldness today as well. We're going to discuss how an impulsive, foot-in-your-mouth, scaredy-cat disciple can go from denying Jesus three times, yo, I don't know him. I don't know that dude. No, 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 I'm not associated with him. Don't, don't connect me with him. To becoming a global missionary who does such incredible feats by the power of the Holy Spirit, including raising someone from the dead. That's the power of the resurrection on people's lives. 
We're going to talk about how a man who took pleasure in rounding up Christians, throwing them in jail, both men and even women, and supervising their stoning. How does a man like that become a global missionary for Christ? Doing missions in over 50 cities and writing almost 50% of the New Testament. How does that happen? That's the power of the resurrection on people's lives. Can you imagine preaching in front of the very people that remember you as the guy that put their family members in prison? And yet even this, despite the criticism, he just keeps preaching. Why? Because he's so enamored by the risen Christ. That's the power of the resurrection on people's life. You know, for the early church... Easter and Passover were synonymous. This is really amazing. You got that, right, brother? I, I, every time I'm preparing sermons, I'm learning new stuff. Easter and Passover were the same thing for the early church. And when I say early church, I'm talking pre-Nicaea, uh, pre-300 AD church. Easter and Passover were exactly the same thing. Actually, in the later church, Easter and Passover were the same thing. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 12, verse 4, go, go there with me, Acts chapter 12, verse 4. If you go to the QR code, that's the first scripture there. Acts chapter 12, verse 4. When I get uh, three people say amen, I know we're there. All right, here we go. So we know the context of the scripture. This is a scripture we talked about three or four weeks back. It's a scripture where King Herod is beginning to persecute the church. And as part of his persecution, he gets James, part of the inner three, and he puts James in prison and he beheads James. Okay? And then now he said, well... I get, I'm getting so much political power from this. Let me grab Peter. So he grabs Peter, and he's planning to do the same. He arrests Peter during Passover. Why? Because so many Jews would be traveling into the city of Jerusalem, and he can show, hey, look what I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm such a great political candidate. But he doesn't want to execute Peter during the Passover because he realizes that that would desecrate the Passover. So he wants to wait after the Passover to execute Peter. Now, what's really interesting is in the King James, in the same text, it doesn't use the word Passover. It uses the word, guess what? What do you guys think? Easter. Right there. Right there. And I'm going to show you that. Acts chapter 12, verse 4. Here we go. And when he, King Herod, had seized him, Peter, he put him in prison delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. That's in the ESV. Let me read the same passage in the King James Version, which was written in 1611. It says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to his people. This is really amazing. Easter and Passover are synonymous for the early church. But the thing is, after the church grew in size and stature, and after the church began to spread throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, the church needed a word to distinguish itself from the Jewish Passover. Now, my vote would have been Passover fulfilled, but I guess that's too many words. So they came up with the word Easter. They said, yeah, this is the same thing, but we need a different word because we, we need to show how we're different than the Jewish Passover. But the problem is as the church continued to grow, it began to pick up a lot of the cultural influences at the time. And church, I want you all to be understand all of this. Now, one of these could have been, one of these could have been that there was a goddess, an Anglo-Saxon goddess at the time named Eoster, Eoster, E-O-S-T-R, E, sounds a lot like Easter. She is a goddess of light and fertility. That could have been something that was picked up during the time. And what about bunnies? Where does the concept of bunnies come from? Uh, as last time I checked, Jesus was riding a donkey into the triumphant entry, not hopping on a bunk dunny. So I don't know where the bunnies come from. And, and bunnies don't lay eggs. Where does this magical egg-laying bunny come from? 
And so I did some research and I learned that bunnies or rabbits are a sign of what? Fertility. What about eggs? Eggs are also a sign of fertility. And then another common practice at the time was the worship of sun gods. If you break an egg, you see the yolk. It looks like the sun. Okay. So Easter became a mismatch of the Jewish Passover, Christianity, and paganism, all mismatched into something that we practice. My concern is that we can get so caught up in the cultural practices that we miss the real reason for the season, which is the resurrection of our Lord and his making intimacy with him finally possible. That's the thing I want to celebrate. That's the thing I want to celebrate. It is God's making intimacy with him finally possible. That's the thing that I want to celebrate. It's kind of like Christmas. I love Christmas. Some of you know that. I start celebrating Christmas in July. Okay, I start listening to Christmas carols in July. You know, the overweight man in a pajama coming down the chimney. Don't know where that came from, all right? But the celebration is the incarnation of Christ. In fact, we should not think just one day as a day to celebrate the resurrection, but to make every Sunday Resurrection Sunday. So then, is it wrong to use the word Easter? No, it's not wrong. I personally have mentors and people in the faith who are scholars and theologians that I trust with my life. They understand theology so well. They use the word Easter. Paul says that it is a matter of consciousness. It is a matter of consciousness. What do you mean in your heart when you use a particular word? So much about scripture is about what you mean in your heart. There's a wonderful scripture about this that's just been teaching me so much. I want to see if it'll teach you as well. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 to 8. Turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 5 to 8. When I get three people say amen, I know we're there. Yep, that's one. That's like two or three. We'll go for it. All right, here's the context of Romans chapter 14, verses 5 to 8. The Roman church is an interesting church, okay? The Roman church, Paul is writing the book of Romans. The intent of the book of Romans is to be a theology text. Paul was planning to spread the gospel all the way out to Spain. He already had sort of a missions base in Antioch. He wanted Rome to be the next spot. And so Paul was like, I need to make sure this Roman church has good theology. And so when you read the book of Romans, it'll read like a theological book. That was the intent. But now the church of Rome had a mix of Jews that had become believers and Gentiles who had worshipped Zeus and all this craziness, who had also become believers. And now these Jews and Gentiles were all in the same church, this same new church. And so a lot of the Jews brought with them the ideas of celebrating, worshipping, and honoring God now, the triune God. They wanted to honor him, Yahweh, with some of the feasts and festivals that they had previously done and of course some of the Jews did not do that so you got all of this hodgepodge into can you imagine that into one house church can you imagine that Jews and Gentiles in one church worshiping God and there's gonna be some practices that they're gonna bring into it one of which is whether or not to eat meat some of the Jews were like hey I don't want I want to abstain from meat." the the Gentiles were like yo I want to have my baby back ribs you know, and then the Jews here were like, nah, you can't be doing that. And they were all in one church. So Paul has to address this. And this is what he says. Romans 14, 15. We're, we're there, right? One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he, give thanks, since he gives thanks to God. 
while the one who abstains abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. And so whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. I love it. What Paul is saying is that in this early house church, you know, if it's Super Bowl Sunday and you get to go to John Bull's house on Super Bowl Sunday and, and, and you see Pastor Roger eating a huge thing of baby back ribs. I'm getting hungry all of a sudden for some reason. I'm like smelling barbecue, right? And then you have another sister in our church, a brother in our church that says, yo, I don't eat meat. It doesn't matter. We all do that for the Lord. It's absolutely beautiful. So in the church, in our church, some people refer to this time as Easter. Some people refer to it as Resurrection Day. Some people refer to it as Resurrection Sunday. Some people even refer to it as Passover. I like to call it Passover fulfilled. They're all the same thing as long as you're doing it onto the Lord. Got it? You guys are so smart. That's how we think about this holiday. All right, now... Let's turn our attention to the real reason for the season, which is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power that it has to change and transform our lives. I want to start with talking about good old Corinth. Good old Corinth. Corinth was like modern-day New York City. Paul spent over a year and a half in Corinth teaching there. He wanted to teach gospel truth in order that he might contradict some of the immorality and confusion that you would typically find in a prosperous city. Paul corrected false views on sexuality, singleness, marriage, eating meat offered to idols, how to conduct the Lord's Supper, and yes, even the resurrection. There were some in Corinth who began to say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, because that has such a big impact on theology, Paul came down on this very hard, and he wanted to teach properly about the resurrection, and he does that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. That's going to be our key text for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. And when you're there, say amen. All right, here we go. Here we go, starting with verse 3. These are the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, correcting the views of the resurrection. For I, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. God, thank you so much for our brother Paul. Thank you for drastically saving our brother Paul. Thank you for showing that you could take somebody that was murdering Christians and cause them to write 50% of this book of the New Testament. Thank you that you could use a man like that, God. And if you could use a man like that, then you can use every one of us, God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. All right, this is a wonderful passage. We're going to get through parts of it. This is so much meat that we're actually going to take the next three weeks, I think, to unpack it. But we're going to cover a very significant part today. So Paul starts this by saying, I'm going to give the church what is of first importance. You all see that? Verse 3. I'm going to give you what is of first importance. You all see that? 
I like how the New Living Translation says it. Paul says, I'm going to give you what is most important. What is most important? I want you to notice that Paul is saying that he is delivering to the church what he has himself received. Read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. 1 to 3. Listen to 1 to 3. Now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believe. Paul is saying, I'm giving you the gospel which you've already received. It's not something I'm bringing, Paul says. You've already received it. And now Paul, scholars are about to say, is about to quote a confessional statement of faith, verses 3 to 5. You have to see this to understand. What is embedded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a confessional statement of faith, kind of like the Apostles' Creed. Y'all heard of the Apostles' Creed? That came out in the 300s A.D. This is like an Apostles' Creed that was around in 55 A.D. when this book was written. I like how the New Living Translation says it. Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed to me. Paul is saying, I'm going to share with you what has already, already been passed to me. Now, this is really awesome because scholars agree that Paul is quoting an early confessional formula in verses 3 to 5 that was already in circulation in the early church. This is so cool because we get a front row seat to listen to a creed, a doctrinal creed, that the church in 55 AD was already believing right here in the scriptures. We get to hear the doctrinal truths that were important to the church back in 55 AD when this book was written, and we, it's remarkably remarkable for us to notice that the same truths are important to us today. Now, I've broken this creed into four doctrinal statements. I've broken it into four doctrinal statements that we're going to cover today. I want you to notice that these are the same truths we follow and hold dearly today. Why is that so cool? Because we're believing the same thing the early Christians believed in 55 AD. We're believing the same things. First statement. Christ died for our sins. You see that in verse 3? Christ died for our sins. Christ died for us just as the Scripture prophesied that the Messiah would. I think this is so cool. It's not just that Jesus died. It's that Jesus died exactly the way the Scripture said he would. That's pretty cool. And I want to show you that in Isaiah 53. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 7 in the Old Testament. I think it's really cool. Not just that Jesus died, but Jesus died exactly the way the scriptures said the Messiah would. Now, that's pretty cool. Isaiah 53. You guys there? All right, let's read it. Starting with verse 3. Listen to this. This is remarkable. He was despised and forsaken of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through. Love that, pierced through. Not just pierced, but pierced through. He was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Some translation says by his stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. I love that last part. He is like a lamb 
led to slaughter. The image I have is like a lamb on a butcher, kind of like on a conveyor belt, and the lamb has its, its mouth um, sort of shut, tied shut. The lamb knows what's coming, but the lamb's mouth is tied shut. Sound familiar? Who does that sound like? Written, over, written 800 years prior to the crucifixion. Come on, somebody. This was written 800 years before the crucifixion. Sound familiar? This wasn't just a random death. This was the Messiah, God incarnate, fulfilling messianic prophecy. Jesus also suffered great thirst, just as anyone suffering the agony of the cross would. He suffered great thirst. In the Gospel of John, he says, I am thirsty. Listen to what is prophesied about the suffering servant 580 years before the crucifixion from the book of Psalms, Psalm 22, 15. You guys don't have to turn here. I'm going to read a few Psalms here, but put down in your notes to read Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 15, the, the David carried by the Spirit. David is writing. He's carried by the Spirit and prophesying on what's going to happen to Jesus. This is when he says, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Has anybody been that thirsty where your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth? That's how Jesus felt. They have pierced my hands and feet. How is David writing this 580 years before the crucifixion? It's the Holy Spirit. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. That's the first doctrinal truth that he died, Christ died. Num tr doctrinal truth number two in verse four of our text in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus was placed in a tomb, and he was placed in a tomb with armed guards. He wasn't just placed in any tomb, he was placed in a tomb with armed guards. Doctrinal truth number three, but on the third day, he rose again. On the third day, he rose again. Even though he died, even though he was placed on the tomb, on the third day, he rose again, just as scripture said he would. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. Go there with me. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. When you guys are there, say amen. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 40. You guys there? Here we go. Let me give you the context of this, okay? This is pretty amazing. Jesus has done a ton, literally a ton of miracles. And yet the scribes are still asking him, show us a sign. Show us a sign. And Jesus is like, I've been showing you signs since I've been here. And they're like, show us a sign. And Jesus says, I'm not going to show you more signs because even if I show you more signs, you're not going to believe. I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Okay? Look at this, Matthew 12, 38 to 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jesus had already done many signs throughout Galilee, but yet the Pharisees' hearts were cold. They would not believe. Let me give you some of these signs. They're pretty amazing. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, he cleanses a leper. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, he heals the servant of a centurion who was at home. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, he heals Peter's mother-in-law of fever. Now, some of you like me might read that and say, oh my gosh, what's the big deal healing a fever? But if you've ever had a child that has had a deadly high fever, you would know this is a big deal. Matthew chapter 8, 23, he rebukes and calms a storm. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, he heals a man, two men possessed with demons, and then he sends the demons to a herd of pigs. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1, he heals a paralytic man. This was a paralytic man who his friends uh, lowered. Jesus was at a house church meeting, and they lower the paralytic man uh, down in front of Jesus. Jesus looks at the paralytic man and says, your sins are forgiven. Who but God 
can rebuke the disease in people by rebuking sin. Who but God can do that? Who but God can do that? Can, can heal a disease by rebuking sin? Only God can do that. And I think the biggest miracle was in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, the conversion of Matthew. I think this is the biggest miracle. Let me tell you why. Matthew was filthy rich. He was a tax collector. He was filthy rich. And then Matthew drops everything to follow this itinerant preacher. Can you imagine that? I think if I saw that, brothers and sisters, that would be the biggest miracle. To see somebody who's filthy rich drop everything and say, I'm going to go follow Jesus. I think that's one of the biggest miracles. Uh, and then there's countless other miracles. I can't list them all. The woman suffering from blood. Uh, Jesus, she, she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. The, Jesus heals a ruler's daughter from death. Jesus heals two blind men. Jesus heals a man unable to speak. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. On and on and on. And then the biggest one, I think, another big one is Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And yet they're asking for another sign. And Jesus tells them, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. That comes out of Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Jesus has already been giving them so many signs, yet they don't believe Jesus is about to give them the biggest sign. He's about to predict his death and how and when his resurrection is going to happen. That's the biggest miracle. He's about to predict his death and his resurrection exactly the way it's supposed to happen. Now, just a little bit on Jonah here. I think this is really important to understand. Uh, God asked Jonah to be a missionary in Nineveh. Now, if I can, if I can paint... A, a map here, if I can show you this as a map. Um, Joppa, the city from where Jonah is from, is right here. And Nineveh is also inland, but it's north. And God says, I want you to go up to Nineveh and be a missionary there. Now, Jonah says, God, these people don't deserve that. They don't deserve your grace. I hear you loud and clear, God. I hear you speaking. I hear you telling me what to do, God. But I don't think they deserve that. You, know, you ever been in a situation like that? Where God is speaking to you, God is telling you what he wants you to do, and you're like, la, 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 da, 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 da. This is Jonah. And in fact, what's amazing about Jonah, that I just, this was amazing to me. Jonah goes all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, all the way the opposite direction, gets a boat and says, I'm going to sail away so I don't have to hear God, so that I could escape God's presence, so I can escape the assignment and the calling that God is giving me. Somebody know what I'm talking about? He goes all the way across on a boat thinking you can run away from the presence of God. How many of us know that ain't going to work? So he's on this boat, and God sends a tempest on the sea, and, and the boat's having a horrible time. So I'm on this, you're on this sea, your boat's going all over the place, and then the, the people on the boat say, look, somebody is the cause of this. God is upset with somebody on this boat. And so they cast lots, and guess who the lot falls on? Jonah. And they say, dude, what did you do to upset God? And he said, I'm walking away from my calling. I'm on this boat. I'm running away from my calling. And Jonah says, look, just throw me over. And so they pick him up and they throw him over. <laughs> That's what I would do right now. No, it's not what I would do. So they pick him up and they throw him over. And because of God's incredible sovereignty, what happens? A fish. A large fish picks up Jonah. And Jonah stays in the belly of the fish for how long, church? Three days. Now, goosebumps. When we, humans, when we as a people turned our back from God and went completely in the opposite direction as well, 
God threw his son over. And he didn't stay in the belly of the fish. He stayed in the belly of the earth for three days. Again, this was written something like 500 years before Jesus even died. Jesus rose from the dead just as Scripture said he would. And then finally, the fourth, the, the fourth one is Jesus came back and he showed himself personally to Peter and the apostles to prove that he was God. That was the thing that was great. Jesus didn't just come back, Javi. He didn't just come back. But he came back and he strategically showed himself to the people he knew would be responsible for starting the church. He showed himself to prove that he was God, that he was God in human form. He did it. He did it. The scripture says that he showed up to over 500 people at the same time, including Peter, including James, and including Paul. They needed not be afraid anymore. The almighty God is by their side. He has the power over death. There is no more need for fear. Can you imagine that, church? You're, you're hiding inside a room because your rabbi has been crucified. Your rabbi has been telling you that he is God. He is the son of God. He is God in human form. And then your rabbi shows up in front of you and says, I am who I said I am. Can you imagine how emboldened and how powerful you will feel? Church family, can you feel the boldness? No more need for fear. In Christ, God was now with a scared group of men and women locked in a room after Jesus' death for fear of the Jews, for their rabbi had been crucified. But now, having seen him personally risen from the dead, this was, as a friend of mine says, a game changer. They knew now that if he could conquer death, just as he said he would, that he was who he said he was, God in flesh with them. And if God was with them, then their mission was now clear. Let all the world know. Know what? Know what? Know what? Let all the world know that humanity can have a personal, intimate, life-saving relationship with God. And there's nothing holding you back from letting everybody know. As the worship team comes up, we have so much more to cover in this text. There's so much. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only able to cover the first five verses, but we still need to talk about the 500, who they were, where they went. We still need to talk about Paul. Paul saying that he's one of an untimely birth. What does that mean? We still need to cover Paul and Peter and James. We're going to cover it over the next three weeks. But today, we learned that the resurrection gives us boldness. Knowing that God has died for us, knowing that God has risen for us, knowing that you can have a personal relationship with the eternal God, Knowing that the Father, Son, and Spirit runs through your bones and your, and, and your very blood, knowing that you have that, makes you bold. Resurrection gives us boldness. Why? Because whatever you're going through, persecutions, trials, obstacles, challenges, God has found a way in Jesus to bring you on his team. Let me say that again. Because that's the best news, church. Whatever you're going through, persecutions. Anybody got some persecutions? Trials, obstacles, challenges. God has found a way in Jesus to bring you on his team. You are on his team. 
Did I say that the persecutions and the trials would probably stop? Maybe. But even with the persecutions and the trials, you are on Team Jesus. You are on Team Yahweh. You are on God's team. That is the joy of the Christian. Amen? It's not that all some kind of, you know, God is not a magical genie that you rub and say, take all my problems away, bam. No. God might even say, no, I'm not going to. Because I want you to make an altar in the midst of those trials and tribulations. I want you to find a way to worship me. I want you to find a way to find what all the apostles found. That in the midst of problems, you can have joy. Because you have a relationship with God eternal. I'm so excited for after service. You know why? I was thinking about this. I'm so excited for our fellowship. But I'm, I'm excited for after our fellowship when I get to go into the world and share the joy of the gospel. What will you do with this new life? What will you do with this new freedom? Where is God calling you to go now that you have complete relationship and fellowship with him? Where is he calling you to go? What is God calling you to do now that you have intimacy with him? Who is God calling you to be now that you have restored relationship with him? Who is he calling you to love now that you have peace with him? God, we just have a simple prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go love Bronxville, Westchester, New York City, and beyond. Not with our own love, with the love that God's given us. I see one voice of all the powers. Above all powers.
time like a rose trampled on the ground you took to fall and thought of me let's just be still for one minute let's just sink that in a little bit what his victory means for us. It only means one thing, that we go out and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't end here. It starts here. God, thank you for your resurrection, God, for the power of the cross. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. Just reflect that in our hearts. Just take a few silent moments. Give and worship.
this church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for this beautiful congregation, Lord God. people say amen. Um, church, uh, just one thing as, as we get ready to depart, we have some awesome food in the back and um, just really quick, really quick here. Um, when Jesus appeared, when Jesus appeared, he, the first thing he told the ladies there is go tell your disciples to meet me in Galilee. And uh, we're going to talk about this, how I think that's where the 500 people appeared. That's the only place Jerusalem wouldn't have worked because of fear. I think up in Mount Tabor in Galilee was the place where everyone could meet at the same time. And it's really interesting here what Jesus is about to say to 500 people up on this mountain after he has risen. I am convinced that Christianity is a go religion. I'm convinced. Jesus wouldn't appear if it was a stay position. It's a go. We get filled up on Sunday so that we could go. Listen to what he said. It's incredible. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what he's saying. When he rose again, this is what he's telling them. Go. Somebody say go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you till the end of the age. If you're feeling really good right now, you're meant to go. If you're feeling, if you're feeling filled up with the Holy Spirit, you're meant to go. Very simple. You don't have to preach. Show people what it looks like to be reconciled by God. Walk in that. And you will be one of those 500 people. Love you, church. Let's go party in the back. Make sure you give your neighbor a hug and tell them to go. See you next Sunday. Amen.